Okay, so we are looking at this on your notes. You should see the picture of the big grouper, which is a gigantic fish. We're going to start with factors that limit population growth, and we're going to run through predator-prey relationships. So that's what we're doing today. Uh, you can see most of this is just um, pictures, actually. So let's go ahead and get started. Before we actually uh, define limiting factors, we kind of need to know what does the word limit mean? And I've given you a, a, an example here, which I misspelled. Um, buy one Whopper, get one free. Limit one coupon per customer per visit. So what does the word limit mean? Well, limit puts that if you want to use this coupon, you, and let's say you and your friend each have one of these coupons and you each want to use one, you can't go into Burger King and you each use the same coupon and pay for the total amount of your food. It's one per customer per visit. So you and your friend would have to go in and each pay for your own meal, then use this coupon, then each of you could use the coupon because there's a limit. You can't use two coupons in one visit. So a limiting factor is anything that keeps a population size from increasing indefinitely. And what are some limiting factors? Why can't we have a billion grasshoppers right here on South Central Campus? Well, the problem is there's not going to be enough space for a billion grasshoppers. There's not going to be enough homes or shelter. There definitely won't be enough food for a billion grasshoppers, nor will there be enough water. So limiting factors usually are food, water, shelter, space. And animals and people all the time either have to enter a population, which is actually called immigration, uh, or leave a population, immigration. And we kind of use these words differently when we're talking about people. For example, my great-grandfather and my great-grandmother were immigrants into this country, which means they were leaving their home country, and then they were coming here and entering ours. So um, we kind of use these words differently when we're in biology, but basically they're, they're both still talking about if you're a grasshopper and you can't defend your territory, you lose it. So then you have to keep, you have to go find another territory. And if you keep losing battles, then you have to go to a new place. So that's what we're talking about with immigration and immigration. Um, the EOC is not going to um, differentiate those two. But if you have too many animals or even too many people in this sharing the same space where there's not enough of, then you can also get disease and then disease starts reducing the population size. And this is hard for us to understand here in the United States. Some European cities, and indeed actually some countries, there's a waiting list for a house because there's nowhere left to build houses unless you tear another house down because we still need land to raise food and animals even though we're changing that. With DNA technology, we have made transgenic bacteria that actually make ground beef every day. And it is for sale in the Northeast in a limited fashion. And people say it looks, smells, and tastes just like ground beef. But it's not a cow. It's bacteria with the cow genes inserted into it, and it's made by bacteria. A cow is several hundred pounds, requires a lot of food, and then it requires a special butcher. You have to kill it and then process the meat. Um, most people don't know how to do that anymore. Well, you, have, you don't want to cut the intestines or any other things in that animal that could contaminate the meat. So space, shelter, food, water, those are usually limiting factors. Now, here's water for the United States. This is Lake Mead, and this is... Lake Mead here, down here, behind Hoover Dam. This is the bottom of the river. This is the top. This thing is humongous. And it kind of looks like it's got a ring, like a ring around a bathtub. And what's happened is there's calcium in our water, and that bleaches the rocks. This graph down here shows that there was um, one, almost uh, over 1,120 feet 
of water in Lake Mead back in 2013. And in 2015, there was um, a little over a thousand feet. That number is less today. And what we do is we harness this river, which makes the Grand Canyon when it goes down through Texas, it goes all the way down the Western United States into Mexico and empties out into the Pacific Ocean. However, we've dammed it up so that we can make electricity as the water goes through the dam and it can regulate and collect so that we can have water. Most of your, your Western states in this country, when they turn on the faucet, the water comes from Lake Mead. Even if you're in um, <clears throat> Las Vegas, California, uh, New Mexico, Mexico, uh, Texas, and then finally Mexico. Um, the problem is we are siphoning so much water out that the last 20 miles of this river, the Colorado River, the last 24, uh, 20 miles, the Colorado River in Mexico has gone dry. And the Mexicans are upset with us because we're hogging all the water. And, and that's because it is a limiting factor and we're using too much of it. It is very real that sometime in the next 20 years, people in almost all of our western states could turn their faucet on and there's not going to be any water. They're currently building a new um, tow, uh, tunnel underneath Lake Mead to siphon off some of the water. We are right now at the point where we're almost at the bottom to where the, the, the siphon point is going to be exposed. So they're having to dig a new tunnel underneath Lake Mead so that literally they can drain every last drop out of the lake. When the Colorado River dries up, all of our western states are going to lose that resource of water. So we can look at graphs with population growth. This is an exponential growth graph. Notice over time, the population size, it gets larger, and then all of a sudden, it gets, it's like doubles its number, and the graph is going almost straight up. You know this as an exponential graph in math class. It means rapid increase in population size. Look at that line. It's almost going straight up. It's population growth with no limiting factors, which is not realistic. Okay, even if you have, you get strep throat, eventually your throat's going to get so sore the bacteria will have eaten all the lining of your throat and they're running out of food. And that's when you get the cough because the bacteria want you to cough so that they hurl, that hurls themselves out into the air where they might be able to land in a favorable environment and grow some more. Um, but eventually, you're going to take medication, and then that's going to kill the strep throat, and then it's all gone. Very few populations can have this exponential growth for very long. Um, he, most growth done for populations is called logistic growth. Here, notice you have an exponential growth part of the graph. It even tells you here, exponential growth phase. But then it reaches a point where it kind of oscillates, goes above and below and above and below, this imaginary line. This imaginary line is called carrying capacity. Capacity means amount, maximum amount. So the carrying capacity is the maximum population size an area can hold without running out of food, water, shelter, face, uh, space, which are your limiting factors. Our cafeteria at South Central has a limit of 450 students. That's why under normal circumstances we have four lunches because we can't go over 450. That's how many people can comfortably sit in that room and move around and escape if the fire were to break out. This is a grouper. Groupers grow as long as are the desks out here um, that you guys sit in at South Central. They can be uh, about two and a half to three feet tall without their fins. They are humongous fish. Well, the fish is so large, they eat several other fish a day. So the population of grouper, they cannot go above the point where they run out of food. So if they have too many grouper, they eat a lot of the food, there's not enough for everybody, and then people, or fish in this case, have to leave and go somewhere else or they're going to starve to death. Usually in the spring and summer, most populations are above their carrying capacity because you have warmth, you have water, lots of rain, sunshine, 
And then when you slip into the late fall and winter, you, the population usually goes slightly below their carrying capacity because it's colder out, the environments are harsh, your older animals in the population or plants or uh, bacteria, they're going to grow old, they're not going to be able to survive, and they're going to die. So that's the carrying capacity, and this green line represents carrying capacity. Human beings, we have overblown our carrying capacity because of our ability to create technology. We now can grow plants in a desert. Okay, uh, scientists at Epcot actually designed the process. Um, we've given it to our allies. Uh, in fact, you can look at it on the internet. Uh, you can create one yourself. But they can actually, the Saudi Arabians are growing food out in the desert. You know, you can grow corn in the desert, even though corn needs massive amounts of water, if you use this system. So our technology raises our food production, which supports more humans. But as we all know, there are people that are dying of starvation every day by the thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. So if we look at these graphs, which two are the realistic logistic growth graphs? And each graph is numbered. So which two are logistic? That would be graph three and graph two. Notice graph two, exponential growth, and then here it levels out. That's your carrying capacity. And it even says carrying capacity for this one is 200. And these are paramecium, these are pond critters. This graph down here, B is your exponential growth, but C is starting to level off. So three and two are leveling off, so those are logistic. One and four is exponential. And this is the human graph. This is our human population graph, except we've blown overblown six. We are at over seven billion now. So notice after closer to in the 1900s, we started growing exponentially. Our graph is growing straight up. Eventually, though, it will stop because there's not going to be another choice. So birth rate and death rate. These are obvious. Your birth rate is how fast babies are born on planet Earth. Your death rate is how fast babies die on planet Earth. And sorry, I forgot to get this. Um, And let's see, um, let me do that because I should be able to get here. Nope, wrong one. Um, there we go, population clock. So let's take a look at this. This will stun you. So current world population, and this is live. This is how many people have been born today. Now remember, it may that if you live in Japan, you're 12 hours ahead of us. So Japan is already into tomorrow. So this is how many people are being born today. This is how many people are dying today. So obviously, the human population has a lot more being born any given day than are dying, which is why our population growth graph is exponential. Okay, But it will actually level off eventually. It's not going to have a choice, because we'll run out of limiting factors, even for us. Okay, now, this one, we're going to start looking at other limiting factors, non-living limiting factors. So the carbon cycle, we, you all have learned about nutrient cycling. You know the water cycle. It rains, falls to the earth, makes puddles, lakes, rivers, streams, oceans, evaporates into the air, and then it either snows, rains, sleets, hail. So you know about the water cycle. This is the carbon cycle. The carbon cycle actually moves as carbon dioxide. And here you can see it says carbon dioxide cycle. Okay, so you see plants and animals, okay, run this cycle. So plants inhale carbon dioxide because of the process of photosynthesis. Sorry about the phone, guys. So plants inhale carbon dioxide. Well, this is not the oxygen cycle, so this cycle does not talk about oxygen. It talks only about carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide enters the plant, and how does carbon dioxide get into the air? 
Well, it enters the air through animal breathing, and we are animals. Now, remember, plants also have a mitochondria. That's what, what we have a mitochondria, which is why we need oxygen. So the animals, we put it into the air. Plants do cellular respiration and photosynthesis. But because photosynthesis makes so much oxygen as a waste gas, plants don't need to take as much from the air. They dump it out, all the excess out. Now, you also, so you have to know that cellular respiration and photosynthesis cause everything to cycle. You also need to know what causes things to the cycle to get out of balance. Well, obviously, too many people breathing carbon dioxide and our factories and our cars and boats and planes. All of that is throwing the cycle out of balance as well as deforestation. We are chopping down the forest at an alarming rate and they really are the lungs of the earth. The nitrogen cycle is the only other cycle you have to know. And this one's easier in that it actually cycles as nitrogen. So remember, the carbon cycle cycles as carbon dioxide. The nitrogen cycle cycles as nitrogen. And it deals with nitrogen fixation. And if, if I'm going to turn this into a, a different part of speech, if I'm going to change its grammar to identifying the organism that does it, it's called nitrogen fixing bacteria. They undergo the process called nitrogen fixation. And here's a picture of those bacteria. These bacteria, they look like tumors on the roots of plants. They inhale nitrogen from the air, and they turn it into proteins and nucleic acids. So proteins and your DNA and RNA. Then what happens is those, those bacteria give some of that DNA and, and proteins they give that nitrogen to the plants. The plants turn it into plant DNA and plant proteins. And then the deer eats the plant, and it takes the plant DNA and the plant proteins and turn them into deer DNA and deer proteins. And then if you eat veal or venison, you're eating deer. Then we eat that, and then we turn what the deer has used from the grass, which was made by the bacteria, we turn it into human DNA, and proteins. So nitrogen actually cycles through the food chain. And here you can see the rabbit eats the grass, which gets its nitrogen from these bacteria. And then here is a hawk trying to eat the rabbit. Here we have the zebra, which eat grass, which the grass get their nitrogen from the nitrogen-fixing bacteria on their roots. And then here is a female lioness bringing down a zebra, and her sisters uh, and mothers probably nearby. Okay, so that's, that's how it cycles. Now, how does it get out of us? How does it get out of the lion? Because, you know, people, not too many organisms eat a lion. Well, when the lion and other animals go to the bathroom, number one or number two, they put the nitrogen back into the soil. The manure is actually Mother Nature's fertilizer, which then the bacteria in the soil break down that nitrogen and then give it to the plants and the cycle of life continues. Now, here in North Carolina, what we have to know is how the cycle's out of balance. Well, it's overuse of fertilizer by farmers. So here, you use um, man-made fertilizers for crops. So miracle Grow, or you go to Lowe's and get some fertilizer, that's man-made fertilizer. It always has nitrogen in it because you need to, the plants need to make their DNA and RNA and their proteins. But when it rains, it runs off, and nitrogen is a limiting factor for algae that grows in our lakes, ponds, ditches. And this is an algal bloom, an algae bloom. Actually, oxygen has to diffuse from the air into the water because there's a lot less oxygen in the water than there is in the air. But when the algae grows thick like this, oxygen cannot get into the water, and this is what happens. And this is actually along the Noose River right now. This is right here in eastern North Carolina. We've been having for over three weeks fish kills all along the river. And that's because they've even talked about it on the news multiple times. That's because there are um, there's too much fertilizer has run into the water. Um, they're still researching to see what else is going on. But the, too much of the algae 
sucks out, keeps the water um, from being oxygenated, and then the fish suffocate to death. So this is how the nitrogen cycle is out of balance. The last thing we need to look at is our predator-prey graph. And this is actually the saying that is in your notes right here. So um, there's always one on the EOC. There'll be one on your test. So the red is the prey. That's the hunted. That's your snowshoe hare, which is basically a 20 to 40 pound rabbit with big feet. And then the lynx is the blue, and that's a cat. And the lynx loves chasing the rabbits, the snowshoe hare. Well, you'll notice that the, there's always more prey than predators. So the red goes higher in this graph than the blue. That's because not only does a lynx have to eat today, but they have to eat tomorrow and next week and the week after that. So there's always a lot more prey than there are predators. But you notice when the prey spikes, the predators, the, the, which is the red, so when the red spikes high, somewhere in the same area, the blue strikes high. Here it is here, red strikes high, and then shortly thereafter, the, the blue is striking high. Here, the red and blue are on the same, in the same area, same for here. So you notice that they kind of a cycle back and forth. Well, when your prey get really high numbers, then there's plenty of food for the predators, so all the babies live and they start eating all the prey, and then you see the prey takes a nose dive. Here's this red line, boom. You went from like, you know, 80 something thousand rabbits all the way down to here, which is less than 20,000. Why? Because these 30,000 lynx ate them all. And then when the rabbit numbers became so low, it was a lot harder to catch a rabbit. So then they started dying. And you see that predator prey actually regulate each other's population sizes. They do it quite well. And that's because you can't get, if you get a lot of predators, then they eat a lot of prey. And the prey numbers decrease. Then there's less food for the predators and the predator numbers decrease. And pretty much that's the way it goes. And we've learned this the hard way. We, um, back in the 1930s, we killed all the wolves in Yellowstone National Park, and the park took a, a plummet in terms of population. The elk, which are humongous deer, 800-pound deer, they became too many because there was no predators that could kill them. They ate all the grass, and a lot of the herbivores, the grass eaters, died off because there was no food. Well, in 1995, the United States government reintroduced two wolf packs we, we got from Canada back into Yellowstone National Park. Today there are three. And there's, they need to stay there because now, it, I'll show you a video later on, this amazing what has happened. And we have time-lapse photography of what the grasses and the animal populations looked like before, during, uh, and then well after um, into where the wolves were established. If you go to Yellowstone Park, they do have the, the map. They have the wolf territory zones published, well marked. If you go into a wolf zone, you are prey. They do, Yellowstone is a huge park, so they do have it very large. You usually, you're going to have to hike for a few days to get to the wolf zones. But you do have to take that risk. That they, they do have a territory. They defend it. These territories are about 25 square miles each. Um, and the Rose Creek, I think, is the largest of the wolf pack, so theirs is even bigger. And the wolves rotate and they move around in that over 20 mile, square mile area. But we need predator-prey relationships. Okay, um, this one is another one. This is dealing with rabbit and fox. So the blue is the rabbit. Notice when the rabbit populations get really high, the red, the fox, gets really high. And then the rabbit population gets low, well, so does the fox population. And then when the fox population is low, the rabbits get high, and you can see this, this cycle goes round and round and round. And that's what we need. That's predator-prey relationships. All right, that's it for this side of the notes.